when I was born, the, my mother and father were living in Crawfordsville, Arkansas. Back in those days, there, was, there were no levees at the river, and there was, could be flooding. This was when the roads were raised up, and the cars were parked there, and the house was apparently back off the road. So he was worried that if something happened with my mother, and, and she had to go into labor, and they had to get to the car and get to the hospital, he was worried about the flood, so he put a rowboat by the back door. Meaning that if something happened, he would just put in the rowboat, row her out to the car, and they'd go to the hospital. But there wasn't a flood. But there was no need for the rowboat, thank goodness. You know, as far as art exposure, my being exposed to, there was nothing like that in the school system in West Memphis, Arkansas. I came here in the ninth grade to Ripley High School. The only thing I can f remember about high school was uh, getting A's drawing frogs in biology. That that's, was my first hint that I could draw. And of course, I was copying it out of the book, so that, I don't know if that counted or not. I had been to uh, Memphis, which was then Memphis State. Uh, I went to school there. I went to, the, to major in business administration. It was just awful, and I just made a fool of myself and was finally asked to leave and went into the military. And I happened to pick a school that sent me for six months up to an uh, army school, a military school in, uh, near Boston in Massachusetts. And six months there, I came out, I was what was called then a Morse code intercept operator. In other words, I had been trained to, be, uh, to learn the Morse code. We understood radio and we were sent, when you left that school, you were sent straight overseas. This was just before the Cold War. And we set up along uh, the border uh, of East, and it was East and West Germany back then, and we set up along the border, and we would find through, uh, we would follow Russian movement by hearing them send Morse code, and we would take it down, we would type it down, we would hear it, we would type it, and we, could, we had what was called direction finding, very primitive today. But back then we would, could check their, direction by their sending. We would know it was so many degrees here. Partners, you know, up in Berlin would take another shot and through a triangulation we would fix exactly where that Russian was. And if they moved the next day, I had the ear, it was like a language, I said, well that's Joe Russian and he's moved over here now because we've got a different position. I tell you all this because that was the first time I learned to use a hand skill. I had to take a Morse code key and through a series of dots and dashes learn a code system which translated through sound to make an image like da da is a, da 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 is a b. You didn't count the da's and the, and the, and the dots but you heard a sound, the sound became an image. When you heard a sound, you saw B. And that, that was my first experience of understanding that you had a, you could take your hand and through learning a skill, a sensitive touch skill, you could make an image. And it could translate, it could be received by somebody else. You could send it to somebody. So because an artwork is nothing until you send it to somebody so uh, that's, that's where I learned something about developing a skill that created something. And it was very fascinating. It was extremely fascinating. Of course, and I was all over Europe because there was no war then. I was all over Europe. And, and back then, uh, if you were in the military, you were told uh, to, to go to the really wonderful museums. You were encouraged to go out and explore the cultural life. And not just, you know, go crazy, but go and really absorb. And so when we traveled, we put on a coat and tie and went to the Louvre or went to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And we, that's what we were told to do, so we did. And uh, I can remember going into the Louvre Museum and I looked down the hallway and there was, 
we're in, in Paris, right? Here you are in Paris. You look down the hall in the great museum, and there's a little guy on a stool down there, and he's, he's got a little beret on, the little French beret. It was such an image. And he's sitting there, and he's surrounded by these things. He's got a palette here, and he's got brushes and paint, and a little, I walk up there, and he's got this easel and a picture there, and he's copying one of the old masters. Back then, you could do this. You could copy an old master. It couldn't be the same size. It could be larger. It could be smaller. It couldn't be the same size as what they were copying. And this was amazing. And I'm looking at this man. He's copied this thing. That's, two, that's part two of, of, of this sense of becoming an artist. That part two has to do with research and inspiration and looking back and understanding the, the history and how it comes down to us. Here's this man doing a painting right here in real time, but it's reaching back to whoever did the painting a century ago. It was fascinating. The, and, and the last part of the equation is, is, is this story. When I was sent to Berlin, Oh, you would go into the, uh, the orderly room, which was the army version of an office, and that's, that's where things were conducted. And they would have tickets to events in, in the city, but they would have been given tickets for you to go and, and, and do these things. And so one night I went in, and there, was, there were two tickets to the, to the symphony, the Berlin Symphony. What did I know? You know, I said, well, if that's all you have, I got the two tickets and got some buddy with a redder neck than I had. We put on our uniforms. We go down to the symphony hall, the great Berlin Symphony Hall. We're sitting on the front row. The tickets are on the front row. And there's this buzz, this wonderful sense of being in a place that's anticipating. You know, I could hear this whole sense of something's going to happen. And all of a sudden, this, this beautiful man walks out on stage. What, how do you pronounce it? Leontine? The, the hair was flowing, beautiful gray hair, distinguished, ramrod straight. He was a beautiful man. And he walks up to the podium, and he turns and bows, and they cheer, and then he turns back to this group of 90 people or whatever, and there's this hush that came over the crowd, and he picks up this little stick, this little tool, this little baton, and he goes, and all of a sudden, 90 people begin just with this, See the magic? And he starts in this, and he points here, and it gets loud, and then he goes, and he gets quiet. And pretty soon, and this is true, I'm crying. I am absolutely bawling that at the magic of, of this experience, of, of, of this man who picks up a tool. See, not once again, a tool of expression that caused that 80 people to make this astounding, beautiful, and unbelievable music that made me weep. And I'm weeping in front of this other guy who probably thinks I've lost my mind. But there are the three things, you know, the, the skill, the hand skill, the research, and the, and the passion. The three things that it takes to do what we do. I had no idea what it was about then. I had no idea why I got a kick out of spying on Russians or going in and watching this guy make, make a painting or this man who walked out and just melted me. But there you are, years later, those are the ingredients that still drive me whenever I walk into that studio. One of the great experiences was going to Rome and uh, uh, going into St. Peter's, and you walk into the entrance. I remember walking into the entrance, and the space is so vast that you couldn't connect where you were.
it was, it, I can remember it was just so, I couldn't understand where I was. Being, I couldn't understand that I was inside a place until I looked way across the space and up in the farthest corner away, there, it looked like these ants were crawling around. It looked like a little few ants crawling back and forth. It was, pe it was men up there on a scaffolding working on something. And they were so far away, they looked like little ants crawling back and forth. And I was dumbfounded that I was, you know, I should have walked outside and felt like that instead of walking inside and then all this space. So that begins to say something about how space affects, uh, you know, the sculptural things that I'm doing now. An awareness of space and sharing space and realizing that space has a has has uh, has mass, even though there's nothing between you and what I was seeing. That space had mass somehow. It was awesome, overwhelming. So it's not actual things; it's exp experiencing these 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 places. And I kind of think that's the way it should be. My mother, bless her heart, she. Uh, she had hoped so earnestly, I'm sure, that I had gone away and become a good soldier and gone to Europe and grew up and, and had matured and settled down and was now going to come home and be somebody. And what did I ask her to do? But, Mother, there's an art school in Memphis. Uh, would you, and I, couldn't, I can't get home in time. I'm coming home on a troop ship. Oh, and that's going to be 10 days, and I can't get there in time, but would you go down and register me at the Memphis Academy of Arts? I never asked her what she felt at that moment. I, I wonder if she just, I can just see her doing this, but God love her and rest her in blissful sleep. She went down and enrolled me to Vita Reed, and Ted Rust was there. Ted Rust was the director, and Vita Reed at the time was a registrar. And that's who registered me through my mother at the thing that became my life, at the place that's become my adult life. Uh, the, the Memphis Academy of Arts and now the Memphis College of Art. Imagine going out of where I had been and having Ted Rust as a director, Vita Reed as a friend, and, and you know, she came on the faculty later. Burton Calicut, Ted Fares, all in this little place, this little old place you'd be in a classroom and the plaster would fall right beside you, right off the ceiling. And, uh, it, but it was wonderful. It was the way a little old art school should have been. Rich in meaning and people and, begin, and, and that's what I came home to. And it made an imprint that it's, it's, lasts to this day. You ask about the painting uh, and how I came to paint. When I graduated, I went through the college in advertising design. I was not a painter. I was not in the fine arts area. I was in the design. And went out and worked for um, maybe five or six years. And I worked for, the orig for Archer Woodbury, which is now Archer Malmo. And um, the old ad days, I was, a, I was um, sat at a board and did designs. And, and I wasn't unhappy with that necessarily, but I missed something that was more creative. So I would, at nights and weekends, I began to pick up watercolor because I knew it could be done quickly. And I could, I could in an evening or in a day's trip somewhere, I could do a couple of watercolors because they're, they're quick. If you take two days doing a watercolor, something's wrong. So I could do that quick. And that's how I got into watercolor painting. And, uh, and then pretty soon the work uh, was, had, had reached a point where 
I was uh, asked to teach some night classes. And uh, I took over from a man who had been teaching watercolor. And, uh, and from that, it led into an invitation to come full time. It's not so much what you learn from people somehow, as how they affect you through their own bit bearing and their own being. And Ted Ferris and Burton Calicut and Ted Rust and Vita Reed have these bearings that, that affect you. And, it's, and, it's, and you can't just always say it's their work. And that's no slight of, of them because they are their work and they were their work. But it's, 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 it's how they, it's how Burton Calicut told me once at a calligraphy class uh, complimenting uh, one of my uh, pieces of calligraphy, and he, he didn't compliment the, 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 the skill of my calligraphy so much as he s said, where did you get this? Oh, and I said, well, I made it up. I, 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 I do my calligraphy out of things that I write for myself. And he said, that's wonderful. That is so wonderful and special. And, 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 the, and he was so happy that I had written it myself. Now, that's what I remember. That's, the, you know, that kind of compliment. Now, I, at that point, I could care less how good the calligraphy was. But I had, I had invented words that, that then put into the skill, you know, that, that act of creation that put the verbal with the, with the hand again. You know, through the, through the years, was, you know, being a, a student at college, now College of Art, and, and being on the faculty for 30 years, and just a string of wonderful, uh, wonderful memories from that place. But one of my favorites is when I, I was just telling you, when, when I got out of the Army and went to school, Burton Calicut was my teacher. And then later on, uh, we became uh, colleagues because we were teaching together. And then we became good, dear friends. And then one, one day, Burton came to me and he had this old beat up book. I, I had developed the paper making program at the college and the book program. And he came to me and said, Dolph, can you help me fix this book? I want to give it to a friend. And I said, Burton, uh, you really can't repair this old book with the, with the leather, we can, but we can make a really nifty box for it. And I said, why don't you come to class and, and we'll, we'll do this. Just come to my class. And so I'm going to lose it here. He showed up bright and early on the day of the class, and he had his portfolio under his arm, arm and he had his T-square, <laughs> and he had his little beret cap on, which I have right over there. They would gave me that when, when I retired from the, when I gave the talk at the college. And Burton was there as this little student, and he, as my student, <laughs> And it was just the most wonderful moment of, of my career, I think, to have gone to school to him, talked with him, been his friend, and then he was my student. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but that breaks me up because of, of the passion that's in that interconnected with, 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 with what we do and, and how we love each other. Vita and I retired together from the college in 1995 at the same. She gave the commencement talk and I was up on the stage behind her. And she gave this, this talk was so beautiful. It was so wonderful. And, uh, and when she turned back at the end, I was weeping again. I guess I cried my way through the whole school system. But, uh, uh, and we just hugged each other big. Every now and then I dig out uh, Vita's commencement talk, uh, which she had uh, text for, and I read it. She doesn't know how often I read that. At one of the graduations um, that at, at the college, before you can graduate, back when I was teaching, I don't know if they still do it, each student that was graduating had to get up 
and talk about their work. I had to get up and present their work and make a final presentation. And this older fellow got up once. He'd been in Vietnam. He had, he, as he told it, he had left blood there. And he had a family and children and he wanted to go back. But he talked about his, his work, but he was telling stories all the time. And he, he said, I remember when I was uh, uh, a kid, um, and, um, and I was, uh, we, a couple of us decided we'd swim out to this island. And so we started swimming out to this island, and I got about halfway, and I realized that I, I wasn't going to make it out to the island, so I turned around to come back. And I started coming back, and the, the longer I swam, the harder it got. And all of a sudden, I didn't feel like I was going to make it back to shore. And he said, and I just dropped my feet. I just dropped my feet, and they hit the bottom. And he said, you know, sometimes you just have to give up. I'm going to tie that in later. Because he went on to say, he began to quote people, and he said, oh, He'd quote people, and he'd say that was a people he admired, and he'd named a painter that said so-and-so, and he named somebody else. And then he said, when you're stuck, when you're really, really stuck, just go into the studio and make something. Dolph Smith. Of course, I broke out weeping. And even the Korean student in front of me, who never, Koreans never show any emotion of touch, you know. She turned around and put her hand on my knee, and I was weeping because this man had quoted me. There I am crying again. Uh, but I was moved by that because sometimes that's how work comes. You just go in and make something. You just go back in that studio and you make something. You know, what business in this world do you go into your studio and and work and make make a piece of work and you learn something wow and the next day you go into the classroom and give it away give it to a student i just think that's wonderful you know a businessman wouldn't do that you know no shots at, at business because that's what keep i, I don't want it to sound that way but but uh, but i just like the idea that he, what, how much sense does that make you work real hard to learn something and, and come up with something and then you go and say, look what I found, and you give it to a student. And you love doing it, and the students love getting it. And uh, I love that whole act of that, the passion that, that came that so many years ago to me out of somebody giving. The, the period after I uh, left school and was in advertising, and then the five years later, I'm 1965, I'm on the faculty, there were a lot of watercolors done. I don't want to make light of that, lots of them. Uh, but, you know, those were the days, I think the first time I was able to, I, I was telling Vita this the other night, the first time I was able to show some of those was in a sandwich shop in downtown Memphis. And, uh, and then there was a bank um, in West Memphis, Arkansas, which is where we were living at one point, in West Memphis, Arkansas. And uh, I remember having a few pieces of work in this bank on pegboards. You know, I built these pegboards and hung them on pegboard. Put the pegboard on top of an old, old white Plymouth. How, what was that? 54 Plymouth or something like that. And drove to Ripley, drove up here to Ripley, and had, had to hold, drive the whole way holding the pegboard on top because it started slipping. And so I'm driving, I guess, all the way to Ripley. If anybody was behind me, they kept saying, when's this guy going to turn right? You know, because I'm doing like this for an hour. And, uh, but I got the show up here. And that's how you had to do back in those days. And then finally, Bill Womack, uh, our friend that we lost not long ago, Bill Womack, uh, the great calligrapher, world class calligrapher, bought a little piece of work and on his way home stopped at John Simmons. There was a shop of John Simmons back in those days and showed it to John. And John said, oh, watercolors aren't going to do anything in this town. Watercolors won't work, but I'll go ahead and we'll have a show. 
And so I did this major kind of show, and John stuck them around between all the gigaw and doodads that he had in the shop. And uh, the thing practically sold out. It was really, really a nice, and it got good reviews, and it got accepted, and things. But those were the days when there were no, there were no galleries. There were no, we just put work up where we could. When, when you went out on the landscape around here, it was in around Ripley because family was here, and it was in Arkansas because we lived over there. And then Jesse, my wife, is from Mississippi, and wherever I ha was, I could, it was easy enough to pack along the watercolors and do some watercolor. So I did a lot of location painting. I couldn't come into the studio. I couldn't do something out there and then come in. I would have to be out there on location. And... Uh, and I began to see all these these houses and where people lived, you know, and I guess they just had nice shapes and the way the way a house presents itself in a landscape. Now out of that came an immense amount of narrative connections. Oh, I, I, I really think I made those watercolors so I could write the titles because I was I wanted to tell that particular story. There were never people in my watercolors. I didn't want to stick a person in a painting and then have the viewer say, well, I wonder what they are doing. I had rather put a viewer in front of a stark situation and let them deal with it however they, they could. And um, I began to use the titles as kind of to editorialize. Oh, like Nerissa Notgrass going, loses ground. Nerissa Notgrass loses ground. It looked like an erosion in front of her house, in front of this shack. That's, but really, Nerissa was losing ground socially, the, the, the poverty aspect around here, losing ground. And oh, I did a painting uh, of a shack that... <clears throat> Named it. It was. It had the Morton Salt Girls on the side of it, and I named it. When it rains, it pours. That was their. That was their old logo line. But really, when it rained, it poured in the house because they couldn't fix the roof. And I did an awful lot. Of it. And I guess not many people uh, knew that. They. One time I did a painting uh, that was on the cover of the Delta Review, and it had been a painting that I had donated to the uh, opera, and they sold it for charity. And if you look closely at this old house, old shack that I like to do, it had no antennas, it had no lines coming into the house, it was completely isolated like that. And I called it, somewhere there's music. And meaning, somewhere there was music, at, maybe at the Memphis, <laughs> symphony, but it wasn't at this place. And I don't know if they ever got that or not. But it didn't, I, I, I was trying to, nobody ever knew that. Um, over many years, uh, was I began to, uh, to see these, these um, houses. As it, you know, there's nothing dramatic around here. There are no mountains. Uh, there's no great, there, there, there's no Winslow Homer seascape. There's nothing bold and big other, other than the sky. And so I had to invent some things that, that would be majestic. And what I did was take these houses and put them in an inland sea. I began to see the hills and the fields and the grass blowing as, as waves at sea. And I, put, I could see these houses at sea. And I began to see them in their poverty and in their their, their problems with, as we grew up with, struggling with this sea, struggling to overcome, struggling to survive against these waves that were overpowering. And, and I would name, uh, uh, like uh, one painting was called um, All the Ships at Sea. And I remember being a little boy, and, and I, I can still get torn up about this, uh, my my mother would make me go to bed early, but she'd leave the door open between our rooms so I could hear the radio. 
And I would hear all these wonderful programs lying in bed at night coming over the radio. I had gone to bed officially, but I, she let me. And Walter Winchell, would, Walter Winchell would come on and he would say, Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. North America and all the ships at sea. And I would just lie in bed and I'm, what does that mean? All the, are there, are there people out in that ocean at night? Like I'm nice and safe in my bed and all these people are at sea? And that used, that just, I don't know why that affected me so. But I would, you know, here's this, all the ships at sea, all these shacks around here, they're at sea. And, uh, and then I would, like, like uh, there was one painting of uh, the wave that swallowed Willie Mitchell. And there, this looks like a big wave of grass and land just about to come over this shack and take Willie Mitchell away. And uh, I did a lot of that. And sometimes I began to let them overcome. Uh, I would give them titles where, oh boy, they're, uh, they're going to overcome. Uh, there, there were paintings like uh, hang tin, like a house was at the top of a wave, like surfing, hanging tin, and I did a lot of that. And um, but they were still at sea. And then the great, the great thing, the, the part I really enjoyed most was if you look at some of these old barns, they have lean, what they call lean tos, like. Uh, the sides come up to the barn and then it peaks and up here where the um, where the hay comes up and down it looks like a, a falcon's head with a beak and I began to say well these things can fly this is their way out they're going to lift off now so I started doing all these paintings of watercolors as if they could fly you know spread out those wings and and the boards became feathers and the 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 tin roofs became you know, feathers and the beak and the wings. And I did a lot of paintings with them, you know, overcoming and finally being able to, to, to beat this thing. And finally, one night, <laughs> it was in February, and uh, I said, well, not only can I get these things to fly, but maybe I can give them a gender. And so I talked Jesse into coming into my studio, and I had a big table in there, and um, I got her undressed, and I got a big white sheet, and we pinned it on her arms in such a way, we pinned it in such a way that it would drape and fall like feathers, and she, she covered up and got on the table, and, and I got my drawing board ready and everything, and I said, okay, Jessie, and she would, she would fly. <laughs> And I would draw, and then she'd get too cold, and she'd cover up again, and I'd get ready. Then she'd fly again. <laughs> and, she, and so I got the barns to not only fly, but to, to have, uh, to have a, a gender. Well, I lost interest after that. I didn't want to, I didn't want to see a male barn. I, I, I was going to stick with the female barns. And, that, and so I named that particular uh, drawing that came out of that. Uh, Jaybird, that's her. Her name is Jessie, as in Jaybird, as in naked as a Jaybird. <laughs> we had great fun with that, but that oh, uh, there was something coming to a close by this time. There came a time with the watercolors that um, I began to realize that. Uh, Maybe I was repeating myself and, oh, and getting, and you'll have to forgive me this kind of strange statement, but oh, I, think, I thought I was getting too good, too slick. I had seen friends get better and better and better, and pretty soon they were rendering or they were, they were bullies, and I was worried about turning into a bully with watercolor. Which, which is an act of nature. And, and that's, that's when I got into this act of nature kind of thing that's, that's giving me a lot. That has always driven me, I guess, somehow, and I'll try to explain it. If you're doing a watercolor and you lay down a wash, 
let's, let's say you lay down a French ultramarine blue. It's kind of gritty. And no matter what you do with that wash, out of your brush, no matter where you place it, it continues to, to do something. It moves, it settles because that grit settles into the interstices of the paper. You know, it continues this little miniature act of nature, this little movement in there, no matter what the painter does. And uh, you take another color like cadmium red that's more staining, and it, it stains and moves against the grittiness, and therefore you begin to get these strange little watermarks. It's called watercolor. It's supposed to have watermarks. Some people, it infuriates to have watermarks in their watercolors. And so I just think this whole act that existed after the artist finished became really important to me. It was like collaboration with something much larger than, than, than what I was as a, as a painter. It's like, why keep trying to get more skillful when you can collaborate with nature? Now, whether that makes sense or not, I don't know. But the whole sense of what can nature do in a situation like this? And, and so I got to where I, uh, uh, I quit using brushes even because I felt like that tool was getting in the way of the pigment doing what, because pigment comes from nature. You know, pigment comes from minerals. It comes from sea life. It, it's made from lots of different products and, and things that go together. And it's just like you're letting it go back to nature in some, some ways. There's one color called Davies Gray that when you use it in a big sky, like in the, the painting Jesse Snow in that big sky, it will separate into the three colors that it's made from if you leave it alone. If you just lay it out and add some water, it begins to move into the three colors that it was made from. It goes back to nature. And I think that's an awesome, incredible concept to, to, to think exists working for you if you can just find it. And uh, so that, that uh, at the same time this begins to happen, I get real uptight about it and I start to pour. I'll mix pigment in little jars and I would take a carpenter's level and level my drawing board with the, with the watercolor board on it until it was perfectly level according to nature. And then I would pour and I would just pour until some kind of act of nature made something that then I could add something to later on afterwards after it had finished, then I, it's like I traded places, I let nature take the lead, and then I came back with some kind of order or some kind of personal note for it. And I just reversed those roles. And uh, pretty soon that even began to seem invasive. And so I stopped the watercolors at a point. I just couldn't keep going. You wonder why an uh, old watercolor painter ends up making books. Uh, it, it's, uh, I love the fact that, that I can reach here and I can pick up this book. Uh, and I've entered, first of all, a physical space. A physical, tactile. It's engaged sense touch. It's engaged uh, sound. It's employed my ears, one of another sense. It's in, you know, depending on the age. If it's an old book, you smell it. If it's a new book, it's got a, it's got an aroma to it. I mean, you enter all these, this aspect long before you enter the. You've got a three-dimensional world that opens the door to a three-dimensional spiritual world which is, you know, you start here and pretty soon you've got a three-dimensional uh, uh, thing going on in two ways. And, and I also like the fact that if you open this up, it's got, uh, this book has, uh, it's got 277 pages in it, plus the cover. So that's 279 moving parts. 
and I like the whole idea of an object, a kinetic piece of sculpture with moving parts that engages my senses and tells me how to find my way through it, like this. It's guiding me. So there, here's this little art object that's doing all these incredible things with you and with your senses. Whereas that other thing, if you're looking at a painting, uh, you're dealing with um, well, a different kind of space and a different kind of uh, emotions. It's an illusionistic space. And, and there's, a, there's a marriage between real and illusionistic space here. And I like that marriage. I like the fact that you're putting parts together to create. You get, them, you get it right and you got this, this whole notion of, and you can carry it around with you. And you can sleep with it. And uh, so I like, I like a, a, a book because it has all these parts, and I give all these parts something to do. <clears throat> and that's why the books I make have moving parts and things that rattle and things that smell. I don't want that to begin to sound like I'm performing. I don't want that to sound like, oh boy, look at all these things that I can make a book do. I don't want it to sound like that. I want it to sound like a whole. Not, not a thing of parts, but a whole. Just like a painting is a whole thing. And I've talked about parts, but the, the, the challenge is to pull it together and, and have moving parts. And, and that's why a lot of my books are blank. My first experience with an urban arts Adventure, my one and only. Luckily, it was one of the great adventures of my life. It was just an absolutely wonderful experience to do. Uh, because, you know, an artist that, that just, let's say a painter, we go in the studio, we work alone, and you're there by yourself. But working with this uh, commission and working with a poet who wrote the poetry for it, but mainly it was an absolute joy to work with all these guys down at the Metal Museum, National Ornamental Metal Museum. And, uh, you know, to go in there and take ideas uh, and then watch this thing come together in this massive uh, endeavor. And, uh, and I found out something. I started out with a, the commission came uh, just, just through a grant. That, that, that we applied for. Apparently, uh, <clears throat> there had been a lot of applications for this work and then it didn't work out and they reapplied and sort of invited people. I don't know the whole, whole story, but um, I didn't apply for this. I just uh, was asked to join in with, with it and, and we went and talked to the committee and all of a sudden we had this. We were awarded this. And it was, it was just, I started trying to draw, you know, I'm going to draw this thing and these ideas and I'll get it. But it, and it was weeks and it was getting awful. It was just very frustrating. And finally I started building models of what I, I had the scrap mat board and I started building shapes. And that really made it work because then I'm working and, and then I started working to scale. You know, like one inch would e equal one foot if it up on the wall, and I would build these models and then take them into the metal museum and we would enter that dialogue about, well, you can't do this, but you can do this. And, I, and then I would say, well, okay, I'll give here, but I'm not giving up on this. And we had this wonderful dialogue between uh, different experts it was like an orchestra. It was, it was like this symphony of, of different skills that came. And it was a glorious thing because I'd never experienced that. And uh, just like anything else, uh, I would get so far and they would, that, and they would build it. And then, then I would be stuck for a while. And I, we'd get real nervous. <laughs> and, and then 
work again and see what it needed and you'd add to it. And this was driving the people at the Urban Arts Commission crazy, I think, because they want every, you know, they want a clear picture. And the, and the blacksmiths, they work from precise drawings. And here's the old watercolor painter wandering in with these crazy models, you know, half halfway there, and they just they they had so much fun. I'd I'd show up one day, and um, one of them would see me, and they would just sh shout out, "He's here!" And then they'd all run, they'd all leave, they'd all go hide somewhere, and I was all alone. <laughs> but I'm saying that because I loved them, and I just love those guys down there because they they would take these ideas and they would they would uh, they would make this this happen and it was I I can't tell you how joyful that was, but it really started to work when I began to it has um, it's about the river. But it's about performance. It's about live performance, and the river as being live, a performance being linear, and nowhere uh, can you stand at this sculpture and see the beginning. If you if you're standing at the end, you can't see the beginning. If you're standing at the beginning, you, and that's how an artwork is. Nowhere can you stand. You don't know where ideas come from, and you don't know where they go, and uh, and so I use that, and I used. I put stages in there as, as in stages of performance and stages of the river, and I gave the river a performance to do on, in, on its st stages. And to make it really work, I began to see the waves that are in it as pages in a book. And the book having a chapter here, and it speaks, and then it exits, and then it opens again and entrance performance, exit, and then I started, I could see the whole thing, except it ends in the middle, and you know, you, people come in from both sides, so you had to figure out a way to solve it, and that was the last thing, they were really getting worried, I mean, this thing was two-thirds done, and I didn't have the middle of it figured out, and I finally said, well, we'll just disappear it, and I built a vertical river, the river that's been going this way in performance, now, you know that one time in a performance where where you, the, the sweet spot of a performance when you've been there, you know, and all of a sudden you say, this is a sweet moment. This is when it goes inside. This is when a play or music finally gets in. And so I made the river vertical as if it was ascending now. And the river enters and disappears. You know, it ends inside. But the whole thing was, Two and a half years of work on that. And it's so funny to, to do something that was in, uh, we, we designed it, it has a, about 150 se separate sections. It weighs 10,000 pounds. <laughs> and we took it over, started taking it over the week of um, the week of installation, and the symphony was going to open Saturday, and we started on Monday. And we had to deliver it to the bottom floor, and then piece by piece take it up the steps. And some of these things weighed three and 400 pounds each. And these guys carrying these things up, it was wonderful. They didn't make me do any of it. But, it, but there, there they are, and they, they would put this thing in, and because they had done their job so well, uh, it just fit. It was just amazing to see it come in and fit and work in, and and oh, oh, and of course the fire department never knew that we had torches up there welding, welding right in the middle of the cannon center <laughs> with these torches and sparks going. <laughs> they never know about that. And it's too late. It's in and it's over. <laughs> the thing. I tell you something funny. We on the, we finished the installation about two hours before the symphony was opening that night. And uh, it was so funny, one of the guys, we looked around and it was done, you know, we looked and, and, and one guy on the job said, uh, <clears throat> are we done? And, and we decided that we were done and so he got this funny little grin on his face and he walked over to his, his satchel and he reaches in, he pulls out a brown paper bag 
and he opens it up and reaches in and pulls out oh, six plastic cups and a, and a quart of hot Budweiser beer. And there we are in the Cannon Center. <laughs> Six people that looked like we street people, you know, we looked like we'd been mud wrestling and drinking hot mud out of plastic cups in the middle of the cannon center. <laughs> and we were so proud. It was perfect. It was perfection. 